Hello, I'm Theron Pummer. I'm a philosopher here at the University of St. Andrews and director of the Center for Ethics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs, or CEPA. Today I'll be speaking with Professor John Haldane, who is a professor at the University of St. Andrews and the J. Newton Razor Sr. Distinguished Chair at Baylor University. He's published over 200 articles and several books on a variety of areas of philosophy, including the history of philosophy, moral, social, and political philosophy, philosophy of mind, and metaphysics. And I'll be speaking with Professor Haldane today about the topic of disagreement, toleration, and public discourse. So there's deep disagreement within society on such matters as politics, religion, morality, fundamental questions that divide society at the moment. Do you think that there are particular social and political challenges that these sorts of disagreements give rise to? Yes, thank you. I mean, I think uh, th this level of disagreement that we see today and the character of the disagreement, including its depth, are to some extent new. I mean, obviously people have always uh, had debates and so on about moral, social, political questions. But I think partly the nature of media as we have it today, uh, people's awareness, levels of education and so on, a sense of political activism, uh, all of these contribute to a situation in which not only do people have differences of views, but the ways in which they express those differences and the ways in which they regard others who hold different views have somewhat changed. So the challenges, the main challenges I would say is to first of all to understand what the nature of this disagreement is. Not just with regard to a particular issue, but more generally what's going on when people disagree. And then a second thing is how to cope with disagreement. Not just a question of how to resolve it in a given case, but how to live with it as, a, as an ongoing feature. Uh, of our social circumstance. So I think there's a, and this is partly the role for philosophy, is to try to understand the nature of disagreement and understand what ways of thinking and behaving it's necessary for us to cultivate if that disagreement isn't simply going to tear us apart. So when there are these deep disagreements that manifest themselves in the public sphere in particular, some philosophers have proposed norms of public reason mm as a way of responding to this type of disagreement, that we ought to abide by these norms when in the face of this sort of disagreement. What are your thoughts on, on this type of norm? Well, the term public reason has become prominent in recent years. It's associated mostly with John Rawls uh, and in his later writings around political liberalism. But the idea is one that has featured really, I think I'd say all the way back to Locke and perhaps earlier than that. Certainly, it's been a feature of liberalism, and uh, liberalism as an attempt to try to uh, find ways of living together that accept the fact that there are these disagreements and so on. Um, it can be used as something of a technical term, the idea of public reason, and we can say maybe something about that. But more generally, the idea is that insofar as we're dealing with public matters in public fora, and particularly uh, on the part of people who are themselves public figures in the sense of holding public roles, that the terms in which matters are debated should observe certain kinds of requirements. And these requirements, for example, might be not to appeal to premises or ideas or values, which you know that others involved in the debate could not accept. Now, um, that in a way can seem reasonable, that um, if we're going to discuss matters, let's not have starting points that we know that others will reject. On the other hand, the very circumstance of disagreement tells that we're already in that situation. Right? So there are, uh, on the one hand, one can see the idea of public reason as being a kind of noble ideal. On the other hand, it may be inadequate to address the depth and character of the disagreements in which we find ourselves. In, in what ways do you think it might be inadequate? Well, I, I think, for example, the, the idea that one should limit oneself in the premises that one invokes or the ideals or the values in which one draws can in a way seem a reasonable matter, but as one starts to think about it and think about the kind of issues over which people do disagree, well, let's just take situations in, currently in the UK and the United States, there are hotly contested debates around questions of identity, for example, whether it be cultural, national, sexual identity, for, for instance, uh, question, questions of transgenderism, questions of abortion in the United States. We've recently had questions involving education around same-sex marriage and same-sex relationships. Now, all of these matters are ones that divide people. 
um, it would be both impractical, unrealistic, and in a way unreasonable to require people when debating these not to invoke controversial assumptions. Because the controversial assumptions are the very things that characterise these debates in the first instance. So one way of putting it this is that the, the idea of reasonable disagreement and the idea of public reason themselves are subject to controversy. What exactly it is reasonable to invoke and not invoke in questions of public debate is itself a matter of some controversy. And then, of course, if we say, well, look, you know, you should only invoke ideas or concepts or values that those with whom you are disagreeing could in principle accept, that is going to restrict matters probably to some procedural norms. So we might say that there should be equal hearing for both sides in a, in a given situation or that one should not personalise a debate or something of that sort. Well, that's all perfectly fair and so on, but it's not really going to get us very far with regard to resolution of the substantial matters. Because if you take an issue, say, such as sexual identity or abortion or cultural identity and so on, there are fundamentally different views here. And part of what's at issue is that each side in those debates regards the views that the others have as unreasonable. Yeah. And, and to be required, therefore, to set aside one's own views is in a way to be, well, can seem to some, uh, a requirement just to give up the very position that they hold most dear. So these are very difficult questions. I mean, my own feeling is that we need to shift now from the idea of trying to find norms that everybody can accept in terms of the values and ideals that can be invoked to thinking more about notions like toleration and living with disagreement. Great. So that, that was going to be my next question for you, is to say what, what you think the alternative is. And could you say a bit more about what you mean by toleration in this context as a, as a response to living in a pluralistic sure. society? Well, let me just say two things about this. I mean, before I get to toleration, maybe just mention one other thing, which is that one thing we might look to do is to limit the scope for disagreement by trying, insofar as it is possible, not to make some matters public issues. So that's to say we really need to think very seriously before we bring an issue into the public forum as to whether or not there might be other forms of resolution for it. So this would, for example, involve us, but this brings us also to toleration, this might involve us accepting that within a given society there may be ways of living that others adopt that with which we have disagreements, but not, as it were, make their ways of living matters of public debate and discourse. So just to give an to make this concrete, really give an example. In the United States, there have always been religious communities, the most obvious ones that would come to mind are, say, the Amish, uh, who live by norms and values that others may not accept and find illiberal in certain ways. Now, the question is, is well, do you subject the Amish to the norms of a liberal society? Or do you say that part of what it is to be a liberal society is to accept that there will be people who don't themselves abide by the, the, the advanced values or progressive values of some liberals. That is in a way itself an exercise or application of the idea of toleration. But more generally what I'd say about toleration is this, that the understanding of toleration is that putting up with or accepting that with which you do not agree. And I think it's a mark of how far we've come in this journey, as it seems to me, from something like social harmony to social disagreement, that the concept of toleration now has been recalibrated or reapplied. So if you don't put up with something with which you disagree, you can be represented as intolerant. Whereas the whole point about toleration is precisely that you are putting up with something with which you do not agree. So not approving of something, not celebrating something, is not intolerant. Right? It's precisely the mark of the tolerant person that while they can't approve or celebrate something, they nonetheless will give it space in society. Is there not a worry that the very notion of toleration is somehow self-contradictory or incoherent because it involves kind of two different attitudes, one attitude in favor of your own view and then another attitude that could be seen as, if not approval, something close to the you know, thinking that it's permissible that there be this other viewpoint out there? Um, could, could, perhaps could you say a bit more about the mm. notion of toleration to speak to that type of... Well, I think if we're going to understand toleration, we have to distinguish it from, as I said, either celebration, which would be the most positive attitude towards something, or even approval. Um, the tolerant person does not approve of a given thing, but they do see that it has a space. Now, 
The question is, on what basis do they see that? One could just be a sort of modus vivendi, a way of go getting on, right? And we'll say something like that, well, look, you know, this is something that's there. You better just get used to it. You've got to live with it and so on. But that seems a rather sort of grudging <laughs> sense of toleration, right? That's just somehow just you know, thinking, well, there's nothing I can do about it now, but maybe there will be in the future, in which case I will then act against it. But I think the toleration can be grounded in different ways. But one way in which it can be grounded is this, is the recognition that somebody may have a reasonable case for what it is they're advocating or how they're choosing to live and so on. And here I think it's very important to recognize that you can grant that something is reasonable while nonetheless disagreeing with it. Right? So there's a difference between the situation which I think that, look, I disagree with this, and I just think that anybody who thinks you know, otherwise is simply you know, stupid or wicked or whatever else it may be. And I, I think that one thing we've, we've learned over you know, recent centuries, but particularly in the second, world, second half of the 20th century, is that there are a variety of reasonable positions on contested issues. So one ground for toleration is to recognize that somebody is living according to reasonable norms and reasonable values, even if you disagree with those. So um, to take some of the controversial issues, it seems to me that if you take, say, some matters that have been debated and matters that continue to be debated, there were reasonable arguments on either side of the same-sex marriage issue. Right? And a tolerant attitude with regard to these would be not to see this in terms of a sort of zero-sum game and sort of outright victory. I win, you lose, you win, I lose, and so on. But rather to recognize that people on either side of that debate, not everybody, but many held reasonable positions. And so what you then do is find, as it were, a way of, even when a matter has been resolved in one way rather than another, recognizing that your former opponent was not unreasonable. And so levels of accommodation. And just to illustrate this in terms of a contemporary matter, there's a tension currently around the question of sex education in schools, particularly in elementary or primary schools, and the question of what ought or ought not to be included within that. There's a case going on in the UK at present, but there have been other ones involving Muslim uh, views on these matters. And there it seems to me that some kind of accommodation is made more likely by having a tolerant attitude. And that's not an attitude of mutual approval. It's a matter, an attitude of mutual recognition, of there being space within which people can hold different views. And therefore, without approving or celebrating those views, giving some scope to accommodating them. So toleration can be appropriate in response to those who have beliefs or practices that you both disagree with and think are unreasonable. But it can also be appropriate in these cases where, although you disagree, you think that the person you're disagreeing with is reasonable or their position is reasonably held. Indeed so, yes. And I think that one thing that we need to sort of think about, and, and this is a you know, deep matter, it's not something that can just be resolved in a single sentence, is the scope of reasonability and what we mean when we call a position reasonable. Now, just to sort of give a sense of what we might be talking about here, one would be whether or not a position is reasonably argued for, right, as opposed to just asserted. Um, but another one would be whether the premises on which it's based are themselves reasonable. And this would bring us, but I won't continue this now, would bring us to the whole area of how well grounded and how appropriate it is to be confident about one's own beliefs. And I don't want to cast our soul into sort of depths of doubt and so on, but I think that a reasonable fallibilism about one's own beliefs, a reasonable sense that although one may believe that one has good reason, one may also be open to the possibility <laughs> that what one thinks is, is itself open to challenge in various ways. Not just that it may be challenged, but that there will be reasonable grounds to challenge it. And so I think that this, it's not as much inhabiting a world of doubt as inhabiting a world of proportioned belief. Mm -hmm. So there'll be plenty of cases in which it's appropriate to respond to someone you're in deep disagreement with mm -hmm with an attitude of toleration. Are there cases where it's appropriate to have a different response, say intoleration or acquiescence? Well, intoleration or acquiescence, these of course are different, but I mean there are situations and there are views that it seems to me are just cannot be tolerated because they undercut the very possibility of social life. So to consider a case, um, let's say the use of political violence 
or the use of violence in pursuit of political ends. Um, there is a long-standing tradition of talking about just war and one can extend and apply that in terms of things like just rebellion, just insurrection, just defense and so on. Now there are people who think that any use of violence in defense of any values is itself unreasonable. It seems to me that position is intelligible but probably is not one that society could make a basis for its form of social life because the conditions of the possibility of that social life will probably involve its defence under extreme conditions. So it seems to me that a case for there being the, a legitimate use of violence is very strong indeed. While we can tolerate conscientious objection, it seems to me that a society has a right to defend itself. Now on the other hand, somebody who says, well if you accept that, then you must be also accept that wherever somebody holds a value as fundamental, then it's reasonable for them to resort to violence in the pursuit of it, or the defence of it, perhaps we should say. Well, that clearly is, is, is unacceptable. So what we're trying to do here is work out the range within which it may be reasonable to resort to force in defence of a value or set of ideals. This isn't a, you know, an easy or trivial matter. Um, and those who've thought about the conditions of war, and more recently about the conditions of just insurrection, for example, recognise that this is a very complex matter. And one other thing I would just add to that is that sometimes when one's trying to arrive at a, a judgment about how to act singly or socially, it isn't just a question of principles and ideals, it's a question of prudence as well. A judgment about the where, the when, the how far to go in a given matter, and sometimes there compromise is called for, which is, again is a very important feature um, that needs to be recovered, the sense of the reasonability of compromise. One needn't regard compromise as defeat but really being part of what one's aiming for, or accepting at any rate, under conditions of disagreement. So you've talked about the conditions of appropriateness for toleration and also what makes it appropriate to have a response of toleration as opposed to intolerance um, in particular cases. And your last response made me think that at least one ground for the appropriateness of having toleration as your mm -hmm. response is the social stability or the very existence of society. Yeah. But do you think that toleration can be made an appropriate response independently of, I don't want to say its effects, but its connection to social stability? Could it be appropriate in its own right in some sense? Well, uh, this is a, you raise an interesting point. I mean, I think that in terms of, say, the liberal tradition, that one direction in which it's gone in recent times, which I understand particularly as a philosopher one appreciates, but which I think may be mistaken, is to see liberalism in terms of certain principles or arguments or ideals. Whereas I think one can think of it as certain dispositions. So let's just think about the tolerant person. Rather than try to work out what a principle of toleration is that somehow people are required to subscribe to, whether they feel it or like it or whatever it may be, let's actually think about the tolerant person or the reasonable person. And this, I think, is a question of, a, of a, an attitude of mind or a, a, an expression of character, the sort of person one is. And here I think that there's something good about being such a person independently of the issues to which it's applied or the circumstances in which toleration may be called for. That is, it were, it's a mark of a certain kind of intelligence and sensitivity to the difficulties of matters, that one, one's personality is shaped in part by a virtue like toleration. So I think that, I mean, for example, just to illustrate this perhaps more generally, the matters that we're concerned with, particularly say as philosophers, are deep and difficult ones. We wouldn't be debating them unless they were deep and difficult. And so what's an appropriate response to deep and difficult questions? Well, one could just be sort of battling aggression and just go in there with your view and so on. But another one might be just to recognize these are deep and difficult questions. So how is somebody going to carry themselves? What's going to be their demeanor? in the face of deep and difficult questions? Well, ones of toleration, right? Ones of a sense of reasonability, of, of recognizing these are difficult, that we're not going to be able to resolve these things once and forever. So I think that toleration in the sense in which I've spoken of it as a character trait is, and particularly intellectually speaking, along with, say, prudence, is a mark of a kind of practical wisdom.
So what you've just been saying connects up with a really hot topic in epistemology right now, mm. which is the topic of the epistemology of peer disagreement yeah. and what the appropriate response to an interlocutor should be when you deem that interlocutor to be an epistemic peer. How does that debate intersect with what you've just been saying about toleration and its appropriateness? Yeah. I mean, the issue of peer disagreement can seem as a, a paradox, you know, so on the one hand, you recognize that somebody is your epistemic peer, that's to say they're equally well informed, equally capable of drawing inferences and so on, and yet you disagree. So what, what are we to do with that? And, you know, can we sustain the idea that there is something to be known here, or do we collapse into a kind of relativism or something of that sort? I see this in a slightly different context, so maybe I'll just say very briefly what that is. I think for a long period, and we, this is where a knowledge of the history of philosophy can be relevant actually, I think for a long period people have operated with a conception of argument that is really a, an ancient and medieval one, it's the idea of a demonstration. So in a demonstration you proceed from self-evident premises via deductive inference to what will be self-evident conclusions. Now it may be that there are areas of thought in which demonstration is possible. But I would say that the sphere of practical philosophy, if you like, which includes in ethics, social philosophy, political philosophy, and indeed I would add something, things like aesthetics, do not admit of demonstrations. And the reason for that is that the premises are not self-evident. And now that raises a question, what, why are they not self-evident? And I think part of the reason for that is that the concepts or the terms that are involved in the expression of those premises or the statements of those premises are themselves essentially contestable concepts. So if you take an issue like abortion, for example, but I mean, it, you could just apply this for any uh, contested issue. Part of what's at issue in that is what it is for something to be a person, or indeed even at what stage something is or is not a human being, as opposed to, say, a part of a human being. Now, um, it can look as if uh, the parties to a debate are in simple agreement about the terms and concepts and then there just seems to be some disputes and then you think how's that possible how is it possible that i i recognize that we're using the terms in the same way i recognize your competence in the use of those terms i recognize your competence and in inference and so on and yet we disagree what i'd be inclined to say well let's go back and see actually let's look at the concepts themselves and actually let's also look at the modes of inference one thing oddly enough that philosophers have not spent enough time on it seems to me are modes of inference. So as well as deductive and inductive inference, and within inductive inference, different kinds of inductive inference, I think one form of reasoning which is very important and we engage in very often is what I call aspectual reasoning, which is basically look at it like this, or consider it like this, or see it in this light, or see it in this way. That's something we do a great deal, particularly in areas of, say, critical appreciation. Think about art appreciation or uh, literary criticism, you say, I invite you to look at it this way. And this can be very illuminating, but what one realizes is there are different ways of looking at things. So I think part of what may be going on here is that we don't, we haven't fully appreciated the extent to which, as it were, we're in disagreement even before, at a much earlier mm -hmm. stage, or there are differences in our cognitive perspectives, even before we get to, as it were, the, the, the matter under debate, that we're already looking at things, what it is to be a human being, for example, in different ways from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I think trying to understand better these central concepts, but also the way in which these concepts are constituted by perspectives is an important part of this. And I think that's an ineliminable difference because I just think there are a diversity of legitimate perspectives on most of these um, central concepts, what it is to be a human being. There's just a variety of ways of thinking about that. And it's a great challenge to see how those could be brought together into a single comprehensive conception. Mm -hmm. There might be cases where people have different concepts and um, we could also debate the legitimacy or, or appropriateness of deploying the first or second yes. concept in this yes. domain. And then there might be sort of further question about, I don't know, not necessarily your track record at judging things, but your track record at deploying the appropriate context. Exactly, and yes. if you come across somebody that you think is typically quite good at that or even mm -hmm. better than you, I'm just wondering if you think that that should 
um, kind of have an amplifying effect, really, on your willingness to have a response of toleration. I mean, you were talking about the, the tolerant person mm. before and how they take seriously deep disagreements. And um, I, I really liked what you had to say about that. And I wonder if there's an even stronger case for being like that person in certain in certain cases or spheres. Yes. Well, I mean, I don't want to aestheticize moral debate and say it's just like, you know, a question of taste or something of that sort. But it may be relevant. I mean, I, I had two higher educations and my first higher education was in art. And so I did five years of study of art and taught art and taught in an architecture school and so on. So before I came to philosophy, I was already familiar with modes of reasoning or modes of argumentation, if you like that are of what I call this aspectual sort. You know, if you're talking with a student, say, in an architecture uh, studio, you're saying, well, that's interesting, but look at it like this. Have you thought of it like this? And so on. Now, um, I think, as I say, I don't want to aestheticize debate because I don't think it's just a question of taste about these matters. But I do think that mode of thinking, look at it like this, or inviting someone to look at it like this, has a place within ethical and political debate. And to do that well, one has to have developed, or by nature have, a certain kind of sensibility, an appreciation, we might say. And I think that too often people who are debating these matters simply don't have an appreciation of the issues. They've got a kind of something that they've picked up in their first year philosophy class, as it were, you know, principles that were going to be invoked in on one side or another, without actually having really developed an appreciation of the issues. And the issues here are all centered around what it is to be a human being, what it is to live a good human life. And so I think cultivating a sense of the plurality of ways of thinking about that is liable to make one a more tolerant person. But what we have to be careful of is it doesn't disable us. It's not as if one just says, throw up your hands and say, oh, there's just too much diversity here. No, because we're back into reasonable ways of looking at things. But what's reasonable can only be as well worked out in the context of discussion. Thanks very much, John Haldane. It was a real pleasure talking to you, um, especially as you're the former director of SEPA. Um, for those listeners who don't know, Professor Haldane was director from 1988 to um, 2016, just before I took over. So it was especially um, enjoyable to talk with uh, Professor Haldane today. Thank you very much. And thanks very much to you for joining us. <laughs>